Hi there. Jess and the rest of the Pay Play Profit podcast team are taking a break for the holidays. Over the next several weeks, we'll be replaying some of the most popular episodes from the last year or so. Thanks for supporting Pay Play Profit, and we hope you have a happy and restful holiday. Welcome to another episode of the Pay Play Profit podcast. Today, we're going to dive into the top 50 tax deductions for 2021. And I don't know that we'll get through all of the top 50 tax deductions, even though that's what this podcast is about, y'all. But we'll definitely have a goodie you can download at the end for sure to make sure all 50 are within your view. Are you ready to go, Marilyn? I am. All right, let's do it. All right, so we're going to talk about the top 50 tax deductions for 2021. And there's actually probably more than 50 deductions, right, Marilyn? There's no set number. I'm sure there's there's twice that many if you if you wanted them. <laughs> there's lots of deductions, typically. The way we like to think about deductions is not can we, but how we. Right. Before we get into deductions, just so everyone knows, we'll probably get to walk through maybe 10, maybe 10, 15. This podcast will last way longer than you want it to if we go through all 50. But we have a nice little cheat sheet that you can download from today's episode to get the additional deductions we won't have time to necessarily talk about on the podcast today. Sounds fair, right, Marilyn? Totally fair. I think the first thing we need to do, and I realize that this is probably a very basic question, but what is an actual tax deduction for sure? Because there's like the way the IRS would talk about it is cost of goods and expense. And then there's also expenses that are deductions, but aren't necessarily on the income statement. They're on the balance sheet, but just broad strokes. What does our dear listener need to know about what a deduction is and is not? A deduction really is all the things you mentioned. It's a, it's a, a broader category. So it's anything that you spend or incur in your business that is an expense of some sort. Okay. It's a, it's a deduction from against your revenue of your business. So whether you consider it a cost of goods, whether you consider it an expense, I mean, a, an expense or even a home office deduction, I don't know. It's all considered a deduction. Okay, cool. And sometimes it's not always a hundred percent of a deduction. It could be a partial deduction. But that's correct. Deduction. Yeah. And in particular, what comes to mind for most everybody is meals. And until this year, 2021, all your meals have only been 50% deductible. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one that stands out. Yeah. And really a deduction, you don't have to stick with, like the business can pay for what it needs to pay for as long as it has a business purpose. Is that correct? The business can pay for whatever it needs to pay for, but when we're talking in the tax arena, deductions are those things that actually get to be reduced from your income before the tax is calculated. Okay, so some of those things that the business pays for might not necessarily be a deduction, like the 50% meals we just talked about, or like entertainment. It might be an expense of your company, but it won't be a tax deduction. Right, because... The goal is to get as much as you could in tax deductions to minimize liability, but that shouldn't be your only reason. Like if your business needs something and there's a legitimate business purpose that you find valid, you shouldn't make whether or not you get the deduction or not the reason to do it. Although some will say, well, why would you ever do that? But I can think of several situations where it's like, yeah, I want to do this regardless of whether I get a deduction or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just wanted everyone listening to understand that maybe there's something you want your business to pay for that it absolutely should because there's a business purpose attached to it, but you might not necessarily get a hundred percent deduction or even a parcel deduction. And that shouldn't stop you from paying for what you think your business needs to pay for. That's correct. It doesn't make it wrong, right? A lot of people, a lot of people think because it's not tax deductible, it's wrong, but that's not, not the case. But we definitely want to maximize our tax deductions, which is why we have this podcast today, making sure people understand, you know, what we see the top 50 tax deductions being, 
whether on the discussion for today's podcast or because they downloaded our neat little cheat sheet um, as a result of this episode. So that's what a deduction is, folks. And we want to definitely maximize our deductions in whatever way we can. And so, Marilyn, I'm just going to play a little deduction roulette here and just pop up a typical deduction. And you can kind of explain what it is and what it isn't. So let's talk about first something like merchant processing fees, or sometimes they're often called credit card processing fees. And I have personally found uh, where people accept credit cards, they don't have this deduction on their income statement or their tax return. So what is this? And let's dive into it. Sure. A merchant processing fee or credit card fee is the amount that you pay the the credit card processor in order for them to collect and remit the sales that Mm -hmm. you you sold. Mm -hmm. So yes, it does need to be a deduction because if it's not, that tells me you have recorded your sales net of those costs, Mm -hmm. meaning your sales aren't, aren't listed as high as they need to be. Yeah. And, so uh, if you don't see merchant processing fees on mm-hmm. your income statement or your spreadsheet or your tax return peeps, that means you've likely underreported your income. And why does this matter? Someone ask. It matters because there's all sorts of forms out there the IRS gets that they're going to cross reference to your tax return. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you've underreported your sales because you've netted the processing fees against it, the IRS is going to send you a pretty letter that says you owe them more tax. Yes, because they got a 1099K from Stripe saying Stripe processed $10,000 and your tax return says you only got $9,000. Right. Then they're going to see that you underreported, even though you technically, it doesn't necessarily change your net, but in the eyes of the IRS, you're hiding income. Absolutely. So they're going to send you a form letter. And if you don't want to run scared every time the IRS sends you a letter, please go and listen to our our podcast about the IRS is not your boss. So stop acting like they are. Right. (laughs) And understand what these letters say. And basically, you're going to have to file a corrected return so that your return matches what they think you should have in revenue. Right. But it won't necessarily change the net impact for you because you will have added your credit card processing fees as a tax deduction. That's correct. So I wanted to talk about this deduction first, because we see this happen a lot. A lot. I mean, a lot. And guys, Mm. deposits are not sales. Correct. In the eyes of the IRS. Mm -mm. Deposits are not sales. Those are just deposits. So you got to know what your gross sales are. And then you got to report the credit card processing fees as a tax deduction. Okay. So while we're on that train, let's talk about third party seller fees and charges. And this has a lot to do with e commerce and talk about problems. We actually have a story related to someone we met who got this letter from the IRS, right, Marilyn? So before we go into the story, let's talk about what seller fees and charges are. So everyone can understand what they are. Sure. Seller fees are that that third party that you have your merchandise listed on. So it's their platform. Like Amazon FBA. That's the most common one, Amazon Mm -hmm. FBA. So Amazon will charge a fee for the privilege uh, you have of listing your merchandise on their platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's all kinds of seller fees. There's store long-term storage fees or storage fees there's there's a ton of different types of basically every time amazon even thinks about you they're charging you that's correct (laughs) and so those need to be listed separately they're not they're not a cost of the sale that you i mean they're not part of the sale that you make they're not a merchant processing fee they're not they've got to be listed out separately Mm -hmm. as a cost of good deduction Now, the story is, is we had a seller who reached out to us who got a really fine form letter saying they had basically underreported their income for their Amazon business by over $100,000. It was huge. 
it was a really big amount. And the IRS, when they send you those letters, they just do a calculation, guys. Like, it's a supercomputer pushing mm-hmm. it all through. And basically said he owed a lot of money <laughs> in tax. And he was just like, there's no way I owe this. And so when we started working with him, we realized that he had grossly underreported his Amazon sales. Nothing tied back to his 1099K. And so this was the classic situation of treating the deposits as the sales and not taking the expenses for the seller fees or the refunds or Uh the discounts Uh or anything else that goes along with it, right? Mm -hmm. So again, part of these tax deductions around these fees is you must report your income as you earned the income. The gross. The gross. And don't count things that are not income. Mm -hmm. We've had that happen too. Oh, yeah. Where people have paid themselves and things like that and miscategorized income that was really a transfer. So not to kind of muddy the water here, but this is why you got to be clear about what the financial activity in your business is. And this is why we always say the best work's done when the books are done. And, you know, I'll say that, you know, from the IRS's eyes and you got to put yourself in their shoes, they're just tying numbers down. Mm -hmm. You know what? You're going to be guilty and you have to prove yourself innocent. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot harder to jump through the hoops of correcting something than filing it right the first time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It can take months and headaches and, you know, just frustration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about legal expenses because those are a little different than professional services. And I feel like there's special things related to attorneys that people need to know. So right. what about the tax deduction for legal expenses? Well, the, it is a tax deduction if those legal services are incurred in the, the process of you operating your business. Okay. Anything connected with your business, but they should be listed separately because they are treated differently on a 1099 form, NEC form. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the IRS in particular, I guess, I guess they really just don't trust attorneys. Maybe they don't at all. (laughs) Not at all. They want those attorneys payments listed on their own little line on the 1099 NEC. So and I typically the threshold, yeah, typically the threshold for that is six hundred dollars, but for attorneys, it's a whopping ten bucks. It's ten bucks. <laughs> You're never going to even blink and incur something less than ten dollars <laughs> yeah. with an attorney. So it's not even six hundred dollars for Mm-mm. the contractor payments that most people are used to for attorneys. It's ten dollars. Mm-hmm. But also, I wanted to talk about legal expenses because those could be a tax deduction as an expense, like an actual expense, mm-hmm. or you could be paying for services related to intellectual property, like trademarks, copyrights, Mm -hmm. and so forth. And those might actually need to be placed on your balance sheet so they can be depreciated properly depending on the amount because some of the trademarks can be upwards of five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Right. So it's also important to understand the difference between a legal expense when you're just kind of working on contracts and things of that nature or a legal expense that you're incurring because it's attached to intellectual property. That's true. Would you have anything else to add or anything about that? Yeah, you you mentioned for intellectual property, but you could be paying attorney's fees for any number of things as far as other assets go, Mm -hmm. whether you're purchasing a building or, Mm -hmm. you know, something like that. So that's a good point to make, Jessica. Yeah, it's really important to understand why you're paying the attorney Mm -hmm. because that could mean that you need to classify the expense as something that depreciates over time. Mm-hmm. Or it's an actual just straight expense. But regardless of that, if you paid somebody more than $10, you list better it separate. Separate, list it separate and send out that 1099. Right. All right. Let's talk about the difference between shipping and supplies and postage and delivery, because those are two different expenses that people often don't really get right. Yeah, we get this question quite a bit, actually, and it can be a little confusing. Shipping and supplies is a cost of good deduction. Mm -hmm. So that should really house the direct cost of shipping the items you sell. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So, you know, if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have the sell, basically. Mm -hmm. right. Whereas postage and delivery is just the normal, everyday, reoccurring, not related to the directly to the product that you sell, but it's for, you know, I'm sending a package to my team or I'm right. sending a package to a client or it's not related to actually fulfilling a sale. No, not at all. If you do direct marketing, it's the the cost of any of that. Which um, I would I would imagine direct marketing, you guys might want to actually marketing. put that into marketing, right? right. So there's right. a little variance there because you'd want to know how much, but we often get that between postage and delivery and shipping and supplies. And this is a good way to talk about an expense can be a cost of goods or it can be mm -hmm. an expense, right? Mm -hmm. And those really are two different types of expenses. And it's really important to understand your cost of goods from your expenses. And that's just a prime example of two types of expenses that one might think should be placed under the same thing, but they really have two very, very different meanings. You know, and I've also seen quite a bit with some of our clients where, you know, it, it's really just kind of a, a coding error for the most part, but sometimes they don't really understand that you can't net the cost of good payments for shipping with the receipt of the shipping from the customers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like with Amazon, they, you know, they get charged shipping fees. The shipping fees is income. It's shipping income. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you pay out to, to send it to a client, that's the cost of good. Don't net the two, because again, you're not going to be able to tie out your 1099 K if you net them out. It's kind of like those homonyms in English. There, 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 right? <laughs> yes, there, there, and there. That's true. That's absolutely true. I thought so about that. I got another accounting homonym for you. Because <laughs> oftentimes there's an account called dues and subscriptions, and then there's an account called software subscription services. Those are eligible for tax deduction. Absolutely. And so describe the difference from your perspective, Marilyn, on what a dues and subscriptions expense might be versus a software subscription service. Yeah, and you might have to help me out on examples here, but of course, software subscriptions are very much how it sounds. Um, you're actually paying for a reoccurring software subscription that allows you to do something in your business. Mm -hmm. So there's a, it, it runs the gamut. It can be for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Whereas dues and subscriptions is, is almost not not necessary. It doesn't have to be like a software dues and subscription. Mm -hmm. It can be like just a, a service dues and subscription. So for yeah. instance, the chamber of commerce, that is a, a dues and subscriptions, but it's not a software subscription. Correct. So you can separate them out like that. Right. And some other examples, like if you sign up for a newsletter subscription, to me, dues and subscriptions is anything that's kind of like a servicey type thing that renews. And so that's a dues and subscription, magazines, associations, publications, marketing memberships, or things like that, that you might not necessarily want to throw down in training and education, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about in a minute, but you want to kind of keep an eye on dues and subscriptions that recur. Mm -hmm. And then software subscriptions are one time or recurring for software. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people will lump software into one and sometimes people will spread them out into basically the top of software it is. So that's the beauty of you getting to choose how you want your books to look because how you allocate it, there's really no right or wrong way to allocate it as long as the intent behind where it's being allocated is accurate and explainable. And the main thing, you're retiring your responsibility. So can you stand up for the decision you made? And the second thing is we want to run our business based on facts and not opinion. So when you're consistent about the application of an expense, you have a better grip of understanding what percentage of your income is being spent where when you go to analyze your business. But these I love, are. I ahead. love the word consistent. So you just you have to, you know, be consistent with where you make the going. decision and then apply it consistently. That's mm -hmm. how you're going to have really good analytics and have really good year over year and understand your return and explain your return or your expenses if you're ever in an audit and things like that. So let's talk about um, for us on a chart of accounts that you'll see on this list, training and education, mm -hmm. 
masterminds and live events, Mm -hmm. one-on-one coaching. These are very common expenses inside an online entrepreneurial business in particular. And so let's talk about what we view the difference as and why it's probably really important for you to keep an eye on these things separately versus just throwing everything into training and education. So let's start with training and education. Training education deduction is, you know, and I'm trying to, in my mind, differentiate it from uh, one-on-one coaching because that's a training too. But training and education are those things that you purchase to learn and improve what you're doing in your business. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're, you're soaking up information so that it benefits you and your clients as you, as you move through your business. Mm -hmm. One-on-one coaching is that does similar, the same thing, but it's literally like it says, it's a, it's a one-on-one training between you and someone else to improve your, your knowledge and your skills to then run your business more Mm -hmm. effectively. And then, of course, the masterminds, I think that's probably the easier one to allocate because it's a event that you go to, um, whether it's virtual or in person. It's a mastermind. It's not just you and one other person. It's a group of people. How big? It really doesn't matter. But there's a there's a, an event that begins and ends either physically or virtually. OK, so that's yeah. where those things go. Yeah, and it's important to understand one-on-one coaching, for instance, that's technically a service that's being delivered to you, and anyone in that one-on-one coaching probably is going to need a W-9 sent to you so that you can complete a 1099 at the end of the year, Mm -hmm. whereas training and education and masterminds are a little looser about that kind of thing, and so training and education could be courses, it could be books, it could be videos or what have you. And then masterminds and live events are like for the ticket cost or or enrollment in retreats or masterminds or live events, just like it says. And then, of course, the one-on-one coaching. And we want to keep those separate because we already know that, again, clients spend a lot of money in these areas sometimes. Mm -hmm. And in particular, if they're in a season of investment and they're finding their cash very tight Mm -hmm. or they need to get a rein in on their finances, These are not necessarily the first buckets that get cut, but if the budgets have been fairly substantial, it might be the the place to say, okay, we can still do this, but here's the cap on it. Mm -hmm. So instead of spending $100,000 on -on one-on-one coaching, we're going to do $10,000 this year or something. That might get somebody five minutes with a really excellent coach, but Mm -hmm. you know, it could be the container that way. We also have to factor in reasonableness, which is something the IRS does look at, look at, okay? So there's plenty of businesses that we've seen who actually lose money because that's really what the first years can typically look like. But then when you look at how they've spent their money, they've spent a lot of money in these areas. And so at some point, the IRS is going to want to see those investments turn into profit because after three years of losses, they could deem your business a hobby. And this is just a way to get your PhD <laughs> covered That's as a right. business expense, right? That's right. You, so, you could be taking trips somewhere to take a, a training class and yes. year after year after year, the IRS, the IRS might look at that and say, uh, I don't think you're, that's legitimate. Yeah. So there's a lots of different reasons to kind of carve that out and just know that they're tax expensable deductions because I can't tell you how many times we've had people ask us, can I deduct this? And the answer is yes, you can. Mm -hmm. But usual and customary do play a part or reasonableness does play a part. So all that's a factor over time. Anything else you'd add to this, this Marilyn? Yeah. And one, one thought about separating them like that instead of grouping them together is, is much like we talk about other expense. If you group, group them together, it's a much bigger number, which as far as relating it to your industry, the IRS Mm -hmm. looks at those things. And if you separate them, you may fall below those thresholds, which then will take you off the IRS's radar. Right. Exactly. Okay. Let's talk about tax expense. Because there's several different types of tax expenses. And I find this area to be, even internally, like we have to constantly talk about 
what's a flow through when taxes are paid out of the business versus what's an expense to the business in terms of tax? This is a great question. So there's a couple of tax accounts that we have on our chart of accounts and on our 50 deductions checklist. There's inter- there's sales tax expense, property tax expense, income tax expense, and other tax expense. So let me ask you first, what is property tax expense? Property tax expense is the, the expense your, your business has to pay specifically for your business for the personal property or the real estate property that it owns. Mm -hmm. Um, It usually is to the city and county in your area. And it's a percentage of the appraised value of that property. So that is the property tax. Yeah. And this isn't going to be super common unless you have some real estate involved Mm -hmm. in your business. Correct. uh, uh, Yes. And for e-commerce, they don't typically have much personal property, which is those things like computers and furniture and uh, non-real real estate, right? But there's right. there's a lot of times certain cities and local jurisdictions expect you to have something. A personal <laughs> know, property. A personal expect. property of something. I know in Tennessee, they've actually, you know, sort of been prying if you don't have anything to say, well, don't you have a desk? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think if you really want tax on my desk, then okay. <laughs> this is really related. And that's the personal property tax. So that it is there is personal property tax to your point that could be on a business retire that could be a business tax expense. Right. For that purpose. Right. So then there's sales tax expense. Yeah, and no, then there's this, sales tax liability, and I feel like people need to understand the difference. Yes, now th- and this is something, I, and I'll put it two ways. I'll put it the, the best method, which is what I would definitely recommend, and then the, you know, not wrong, but not ideal method, okay? So let's go to the not wrong, but not ideal method. Some actually record as expense every single amount of sales tax that they pay. Okay. And the amount that is collected from the customer, they include in the sales up above. Right. It's it's in the income. So therefore okay. they take the, the deduction. Exactly. And then they just post the sales in sales tax. But expense. you don't get to take sales tax expenses if you don't report the sales tax income. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point there. And so, it's not wrong, but not ideal. So we almost like want you to be like, oh, I said it erase that out of your head right because that's kind of messy what you want to do and and i'll try to put it as simply as possible but there's that sales tax liability account that you just mentioned when you collect sales tax from a customer it needs to go to that liability account correct so it piles up for the in, the sales tax that got collected right through the month or the quarter and then when you pay the sales tax organization then that goes against that money liability. that you collected. That right. goes against that liability. So in an ideal world, it would be a zero net effect, right? But we're not in an ideal world. It, it, I've never seen it have a zero effect. There's typically some small difference between the amount you collect and the amount that you pay. Which technically is owed to the states if you overcollected. If you overcollected, yes. But if, if, you, if you didn't have an overcollect situation and you were holding a balance in that liability account, are you saying that's the part that comes over to the sales tax expense? Yes. Yeah. So if you didn't collect enough and you had to pay it anyway, mm-hmm. it's that difference that comes over to your sales Correct. tax expense account. Yeah. And that is a little bit more like advanced. It has to do with mm-hmm. sales tax. But we can't not talk about it because even for our online business owners, I'm talking to you, course creators membership owners, coaches, and what have you, the states are coming for you. And so is the federal government. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's not just an e-commerce conversation anymore. And we've got to start talking about it now. So we're not like caught without having a net to hold us up a little around sales tax. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to talk about the difference because just collecting sales tax and throwing it on your income statement as sales tax expense, not going to work. No. Got to understand how that's happening. And if you have someone doing your books for you, please make sure you are armed with this knowledge so that you can be 
I'm going to do a little PSA. If you have a bookkeeper that doesn't exempt you from personal responsibility of understanding what's been allocated on your books, if you are audited and the IRS determines you have expenses you claimed that were not allowable, you cannot blame your bookkeeper. That's right. You need to take personal responsibility for how your reports look and how your taxes are filed. So having said that, let's talk about income tax expense and what it is as an expense and what it isn't, because there's a lot of fuzziness with this one too. Okay. Income tax, uh, you have income tax. You have income tax on your business. You have income tax on your personal tax return. You have income tax for federal and you have income tax for state. Okay. So the amount that is a business tax deduction is the tax that you pay for in the business name. That's, that's probably as clear as I can, I can put mm-hmm. it. So if your business files a separate state business tax return in that business's name, that tax you can actually record as a business tax deduction. If you pay for anything through your personal name, then it does not go on the income statement. It is not a business tax deduction. Um, And we get this question a lot too, because a lot of our clients are sole owners, whether they're a, a, a single member LLC or a sole proprietor their whole earnings is generated out of their business, Mm -hmm. right? So in their minds, this is a business tax deduction because the income that they're paying it for is directly out of their business. But that is not the case. If you are paying for any kind of tax on your 1040, your form 1040, which is your personal income tax return, that does not go on your income statement. Mm -hmm. If you're paying for any state income tax that's in your personal name, that does not go on your income statement. Correct. Okay. But those things like, of course, C-Corps have federal income tax that can go on your income statement. And S-Corps can have state. And and, and S-Corps can have state, but S-Corps cannot have payments to the IRS that go on their income statement as far as the, the, the income tax goes. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's just important to understand the difference between a legitimate income tax expense because we've seen people show up and every payment they made everywhere was on Mm -hmm. their their P&L. Right. And none of the payments were legit income tax expensable items. Mm -mm. So again, if your bookkeeper's pushing it there, if you're pushing it there, please get a process in place to document what that particular payments for because this is also what gets really hard during tax season people have made estimated tax payments or they've made tax payments they didn't put any descriptions on those payments and then everybody's scrambling to try to figure out what was paid when and that's really important but then you can't reduce net income by those things that are not expensable so mm-hmm. you're going to have problems if you do that and ask us how we know we've seen it all peeps <laughs> We've, we've missed a few. So, yeah. Hey, and we missed right a few. These, these are like, we're speaking from the scar and not the wound, y'all. Right. So, then there's other tax expenses like license and permit expenses or gross receipts or franchise and excise tax. So, there are other types of taxes or things that people pay for that are legitimately business. So any additional thoughts or anything you'd have to share around that? No, they vary by state by state, really, uh-huh. in jurisdiction by jurisdiction. But I think anything not directly tied to income should go there, mm-hmm. um, as long as it's not on a personal income tax return. And then, of course, there's meals and travel. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we spoke a little bit about meals, and it is important for everyone to understand that. Meals is a really finicky thing, especially now in the pandemic era where the government is allowing you and actually promoting for you to do whatever you can to support small businesses, especially restaurants, because the hospitality industry has been the hardest hit by the pandemic. So in 2021, right, Marilyn, like you get 100% of your meals regardless of as long as it had a business purpose, correct? That's correct. But normally, 
most of the time, meals with business purposes are 50%. Or if you have employees and things like that, you could qualify for those meals to be 100%. Yeah. Um, it, so it really is important for you to understand what meals are 100% and what meals are 50% and that they're at being allocated properly. That's right. And it's all about the documentation. So mm-hmm. you really have to be a very very consistent about your documentation of those items because in an IRS audit, they're going to consider <laughs> none of its businesses if you don't indicate on that receipt who it was with, uh, where you were, and what you talked about. Yeah. And two, they're going to look at reasonable and customary or usual and customary, depending on the language mm-hmm. you use. So if 80% of your expenses are meals in relation to your income that's that could pose a a problem Uh, uh, it would Mm -hmm. and if you're consistently posting losses year after year after year and you have abnormally high meals and travel and training and education it just looks like it doesn't look like you have a business it looks like you have something you have a shell Right. So you have to just pay attention to those things as well. It's not a reason not to do those things. This is just to help you be mindful of that. And and something else I find uh, a lot of times people don't don't find is that, you know, if you if you purchase any alcohol, even Mm -hmm. on a business dinner, um, which is very common, that that's technically not taxable tax Mm -hmm. deductible. So you got to just account for those things. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to use office and supplies expense versus office equipment. Okay. There is a difference between these two, right? And Mm -hmm. I think this gets kind of crazy sometimes when people see office equipment and office and supplies expense on their chart of accounts. Office equipment typically is not an income statement account. Mm -hmm. It is a balance sheet account. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, you know, we're required to to be categorized that way so you can depreciate it because it's typically an asset that is a high dollar that has a shelf life of three or more years that's correct that's so and these days the cost of laptops have gone down so much and sometimes you're replacing those puppies every year depending on what kind you got so a laptop isn't necessarily always an asset in terms of office equipment. It could easily be an office and supplies expense. Absolutely. And we, we you know, we have a process, we have parameters. I'm um, actually a kind of a, a level, a limit, a dollar limit that you can spend mm-hmm. before it is con- even, you know, considered it might be an equipment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, internally we have said $2,500. Mm-hmm. You now, as long as you're consistent, just decide on that, that um, level and be consistent with it mm-hmm. um, and you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And there's some benefit to that if you are have an entity structure that will allow you to kind of support that type of process. But it's really important to identify your assets. Incidentally, if you do have assets, I'm sure your city or your county want your personal property tax return. Mm-hmm, that's right. Okay. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be an asset on your books to be considered an asset to them, but that's really a, a good definition for you. And then there's office and supplies expense. And I know it sounds very self-explanatory, mm-hmm. but it's expenses related to office and supply purchases, basically for exclusive use by the business. Mm-hmm. This is not for your homeschool post-its. No. <laughs> it's not. And a lot of people probably do try to do that. I I, I know they do. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is legitimately supplies that have been purchased for the use within the business. This is not, mm-hmm. again, a piggy bank for you to just purchase all the supplies you need. And it's not to say we don't use these things personally, but It needs to have a significant business purpose. And most of the time, as a general rule, you're using it for business. If you're homeschooling your kids, guys, don't be running your homeschool supplies, ideally through your business and then treating it as a business expense. So, right. And I, you know, I'll say this, like I I did the, um, the dues and subscription, or no, the training and the um, one-on-one coaching. I mean, when, if you're shoving a lot of things Netflix, into office, Hulu, yeah. <laughs> <If> like, <you're, laughs> ask us how we know this, y'all. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> we've seen it. But listen, I mean, if that gets to be a larger than is normal expense, that's going to create a flag for the IRS. And if mm -hmm. you get audited with all that stuff in the business, you might as well open your, your every single expense to scrutiny because yeah. they're going to be looking not only at office expense, they're going to be looking at everything. And let me tell you, we've heard it all. Well, I use my Amazon Prime to watch documentaries mm -hmm. and I use my Netflix to watch documentaries. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you the screen time that you have on Netflix, because like it knows everything you watch. It knows it the time you watch it, the amount of time you watch it. Like if you were ever audited, I don't, you'd have a hard case, I think, about Netflix, unless you could literally demonstrate every screening had a business purpose. Now, maybe if you're a cinematographer. Yeah, there, there's purposes you know, for there's, it. Yeah. There's real purposes for it. Um, but if they audit you and they find two or three years that you do that, they're going to they're going to go after as much as they possibly can when as far back as they possibly can. When they can. suspect that you haven't consistently and meaningfully, thoughtfully and intentionally took care of what you ran through the business, they will just, I mean, we've had that conversation before on the podcast. It will just open the door for them to keep looking and to dig mm -hmm. further. Yeah. And so what you want to demonstrate right out the gate, if you're ever audited, is you want to demonstrate that you're a knowledgeable business owner who has done the very best that you can absolutely do to play by the rules. Mm -hmm. As we say, walk the line, but don't cross the line. Right. Right. So, but now there's some people out there that are super aggressive. They're going to throw everything they can there that we're not the accountants for you. So download the sheet, but don't sign up for a discovery call. Okay. Cause you'll be surely disappointed by the guidance we give you. I promise. If you're like one of those super aggressive entrepreneurs that put your whole household through your business. Right. Okay. And there's, Hey, to each his own. All right. So let's talk about wages and salaries versus contract labor versus virtual assistant services. Cause those are three expenses that come up wages and salaries is basically related to W2. So if you yeah. don't have payroll, you don't have to worry about that. Right. But what I do want to say about the wages and salaries is gross salary and the payroll tax expense has to hit, which isn't the amount deducted from the employee's paycheck. It's the amount that the employer is responsible to pay. And trust me, we've seen people who have a payroll company and all they do is book the net transactions. Mm -hmm. out of the bank to wages and salaries, which means they're missing deductions. Mm -hmm. And their wages and salaries don't equal their W-2s, which is also going to cause a problem. problem. <laughs> right. So, and so then there's contract labor and then there's like, there's this kind of new school virtual assistant services. And so it's, it's really important to keep this contract labor account fairly clean so you have a good year end in January to get your 1099s that you should send out the door. Right. Right. Yeah. And a virtual assistant service could be like you're paying Upwork for something or, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're paying an international VA so there's not technically like a 1099 that's due to them necessarily or something like that. So. Just know those can be expense items, but you need to be clear about what you're expensing where. Right. Anything else you would add for that, Marilyn? No, I think that's about covers those. Yeah. Honestly, guys, I think this covers the bulk of some of the major things that you probably experience, but it isn't all 50. And we do have some bonus deductions related to Amazon FBA and e-commerce. So I want to encourage you to click the link on the podcast. And get your PDF download of the top 50 deductions for 2021. Marilyn, anything you'd like to add for anybody related to expense deductions? No, it can be a complex world out there, but just yeah. be consistent and have a process in place and you'll be fine. Yeah, don't put your head in the sand. Don't blame your bookkeeper if your tax mm -hmm. return ends up not being right. Or when you go to scrub your account, you haven't talked to your bookkeeper all year and all of a sudden they're just bad, bad, bad. Mm -hmm. No, you need to look at your books. Okay. They need direction too. And just the same way you need to be looking at your tax return and making sure it's right. Mm -hmm. Because you are the one that's going to have to stand up for this in the event of an audit. Okay. So 
really don't abdicate responsibility. Understand where you need to allocate things and what expenses are what. And listen, once you make the decision, you don't have to make it again. Mm -mm. There's ways to make this a very efficient process and you don't have to wonder or worry and you can have complete peace of mind. Okay. So this is just to help you guys understand that you don't want to leave any money on the table. And you also want to stay involved in the process of your accounting and tax, even if you outsource the work. That's a wrap, folks. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Pay, Play, Profit podcast. Before we walk away from the table, it's sharing is caring time because we are on a mission as a team at the bottom line to multiply and to help you multiply too. We are sowing seeds in faith to serve 100,000 entrepreneurs like you by the year 2030. We want to help others reimagine their entrepreneurial success with simple, practical, powerful solutions. This podcast is the place we want people to plug in and keep coming back to. If you haven't yet, please hit subscribe wherever you choose to listen. You can find us on all the major platforms, including YouTube. We'd like to encourage you to join our growing community by signing up for our email list so you never miss an episode or value-added shares delivered each week. The link is in our show notes. We'd also love if you'd take a few minutes to give us a five-star review wherever you listen and share our podcast with a fellow entrepreneur that you believe would benefit from being here. Remember, every decision is a profit decision and profit is measured in time, energy, and money. We want to see triple scoops on all three kinds of yours when it comes to your pay, play, and profit. You are worthy of all the good, my friend, and so much more. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. See you later.